Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me in this talk about the hidden flows of the paper trade of the paper business in early modern Europe. When talking about paper mobility, as this conference, for example, intends to, I think it's important to remind ourselves of the trading activities referred to as material flows and the functioning of a circular paper economy behind all early modern paper usages. And these usages include writing, publishing, and wrapping. In fact, and as I'll try to highlight in the next 15 minutes and in the following discussion, the mobilities behind paper usages of the period range from rack transportation to recycling networks to shipping agencies and beyond. The publishing or printing industry of the period is only one part of the larger and widely interconnected paper flows. Early modern Europe was a paper age, an age of paper production, of paper usage and of paper consumption, and also of paper trading. When referring to the historiographical period of European early modernity from circa 1400 to 1800, it seems appropriate to name this time span the first European paper age. And this paper age was a business run by merchant activities, fueled by an increasing demand for paper and kept alive in a recycling modus that included line and rags, old papers, new papers, and the paper consumption in administrations and communications and in the so-called print industries. As a reminder, line and rag, as you can see um, on, this, <clears throat> on this picture, on this image, um, was used and is often fine as a, as a leftover in paper sheets. So here you have to symbolize for these connections between a, a trading activity and economic activity and the publishing industry. You all know that by the time that paper was introduced and produced in Europe, first by Arab paper makers and then by Arab trade contacts, the artifact paper was already an established and known product used and produced in China for more than 1,300 years. Europe's first paper age may have started with trade imports, but it's commonly known that a separate way of producing paper eventually developed. By the 14th century, paper mills became an investment option within the commercial world. And with the spread of the art of making paper through Europe, paper sheets started their journey as a commonly known economic good. In fact, paper products of European origin quickly became a trans-regionally sold, moved and traded good. In keeping with the broader trade mobility of the period, these early modern paper flows reached places and regions both with and without their own paper mills and established a first regular market for the purchase, usage and consumption of paper. As a reminder, from its earliest days in Europe, the man-made artifact paper was a hand-formed and moved economic good that was produced as a commodity to be sold. The accompanying economic activities of producing, of moving, of selling paper are echoed in historiographical interpretations as the founding moments of an early modern paper industry. The products made, moved and sold by this industry, mainly for writing, printing and wrapping purposes, were purchased and used in growing numbers. Paper became a good and steadily selling product in Europe, as paper was increasingly used in more and more individual and public contexts, including education, administration, correspondence, arts, transports, and of course, within the burgeoning print industries in Europe. In many paintings of the time, like this example from the 17th century from the Net Netherlands, um, we find these paper usages reflected. If you use Twitter, have a look at uh, using the hashtag paper history to look into more examples of these paper usages reflected in paintings. New and, oh, there's another one, another example. Here's paper used uh, as for wrapping purposes, old paper, that's a used paper used again to, um, to sell or to trade pepper. 
new and quickly expanding paper usages in archiving and administration and communicating and wrapping activities are legion within the historiography of early modern Europe. And in some, they tell us a history of paper as one of the main material characteristics of the period. Purely by numbers, the artifact paper was among the most typical economic goods of the period. Yet, however, the historiography of early modern Europe somehow remains a curiously paperless history. And I think we need to change this. What is missing or what we should pay more attention to, in my belief, is the way and context of this mobility of paper. As I told you, the artifact paper was moved, it was stored, traded, resold, recycled, and so on. We need more attention to the material flows of this paper economy in order to better understand paper usages and paper problems for printing, for writing, for wrapping. In a nutshell, we need to find answers to the basic question, where are the yet invisible trading activities behind all these visible paper relics that were once produced, moved, read, stored, used, recycled all over Europe? Recently, investigations into this overlooked but crucial economy began for early modern Europe by focusing on the practices, materials, and networks of the paper trace, paper trade. This edited volume, and here please excuse my self-promotion, this edited volume will come up in June 2021 and is the first um, publication solely devoted to the trade of paper. As we know little to nothing about how the paper trade transpired, we're deeply in need of insights into actual trade, paper trade practices. Such a focus will be helpful in making the many historical paper flows more visible. Highlighting these practices opens the door to addressing the social and business activities of the trades participants. Describing these practices, which include, for example, the transporting, the collecting, the storing, and of course the selling of paper and its material resources, is an actor and praxis oriented approach to human involvement in trade activities that made up in some what we call the paper trade. On a very basic level, approaching the practices of the trade requires considerations of all human involvement in the processes of the paper industry. We need an actual-led perspective on these traits, on these practices. Who is involved? Who runs the material flows of this economy? Regarding this often used image from the 1560s, a copper plate print from Joost Ammann, we may ask the paper transporting boy on the left, where are you going? What exactly are you moving? And to whom are you selling it? To what price? Another benefit for paper trade history is a nuanced material focus. To begin with, materiality as a theme opens a renewed discussion of the plurality of paper products and raw materials traded on the early modern markets for paper. It seems worth remembering that dozens to potentially hundreds of different kinds of paper products and relevant raw materials required in paper manufacture made up the material flows of the paper trade. Also available on these paper markets were used and old papers from unsold, rejected, or slow selling books, as well as from ephemeral publications like small pamphlets or cheap newspapers that were systematically sold to customers like fishmongers or grocers, and of course to paper makers who need this material resource for the manufacture of new paper. Waste and old papers are part of this paper economy. And we need a European and later um, a trans-regional perspective um, on the trade flows of this trade, on the trade units used. A ream, for example, is not the only unit and paper trade and paper was offered in so many units from thousands of sheets to single sheets. Paper was cheaper and is more available than usually calculated within our historiography. We should look more carefully again, what was sold in bookstores and elsewhere. On the right, you see 
the interior of a Dutch bookseller from the 17th century and his normal range of publications on offer. On the left, you see trade units of the paper trade, reams as here on a, on a ream wrapper from Isaac, Isaac van Putte, um, a paper trader. And if you look, <clears throat> if you look back on the, on the bookseller, um, on the bookshop interior, you see that these paper reams are reflected on top of the shelves. A material focus also explores the physical conditions of the trade and transport of these paper goods in early modern Europe. Paper did not just travel on its own to different destinations, but it was moved by people from the mills to warehouses to apothecaries to print shops and to many more places of buying and selling and reselling. A nuanced paper history investigates the materiality of these movements as well as where they break down in more detail. In fact, the material details of the shippings of paper commodities by boat and by wagon are largely unknown, as are the locations and material conditions of the places of storage of paper products. We are in need of studying the physical ins and outs of paper in order to write a material story of the commodity and its trade. Who transported, sold and bought paper? Who stored it under which material conditions? Where? and who resold it again? We need to ask more questions, for example, about this image. In the back, you see a paper mill. So here's the place, the location of manufacture, and you see the selling of goods. Who's the seller? Who's the buyer? What exactly is purchased and what is offered? To sum up, the yet hidden flows of a connected paper economy have been put on the agenda and will be more addressed in the, in the next years, I think. In research networks like this one, the awareness of the benefits of a newly accentuated paper history is looming, making the hidden flows more visible by focusing on the involved actors, the actual traded goods from line and rags to fresh paper in hundreds of qualities and formats to waste papers and so on, and the network connections of these activities, for example, in financing, offers a historical interpretation of a bird's eye view on the patterns of the paper flows within a larger paper economy. As I'm arguing in my latest book and in an introduction of the first volume on the paper trade, a bigger picture of a circular paper economy emerges, a circular paper economy. By describing the historical contexts of the paper trade as a connected economic sector in which materi necessary materials of the paper markets were manufactured, traded, stored, sold, bought, used, reused, and finally recycled by a numerous range of cooperating actors and networks, a larger textile rags and paper economy becomes visible. And this circular paper economy is much more than just a supplemental aspect of an alleged age of print of early modern Europe, as it has been influentially been characterized in the last decades by media and book historians alike. In fact, a broad to be designed paper history of early modern Europe and beyond is an alternative master narrative for the epoch in question. A new master narrative of early modern Europe seems possible. And in this master narrative, line and rags are as important as printed upon papers and their media effects. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>